Hi everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, we have one o'clock here today, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I am the marketing coordinator for Extra Help, uh, which is a workforce management company, if you're not familiar with us. Uh, today you've joined our Workplace Excellent webinar series um, entitled Employers' Rights in a Social Media Environment. Um, our presenter today is Thomas Berry, and I will introduce him momentarily. The Workplace Excellence webinars are an exciting new program that Extra Help has started about a year ago um, for our clients and colleagues to manage workforce changes and bring efficiency to your workplace. Um, just a few things to discuss before we begin. This call will last um, about one hour. You are set up as listen-only mode, so if you do have questions, please type those at the bottom um, of your GoToWebinar screen, and we will address those at the end. Um, and basically what we're going to do today is go through the PowerPoint and uh, at the end do the questions. Um, so let's get started. Today our presenter is Thomas Berry of Samber Phoenix in Mount Gothard. Um, a little bit about Thomas. He is a shareholder, and he is also a member and the former practice group leader of the Business Litigation Group. Tom is also part of the Business Law Practice Group. He focuses his practice in the areas of labor and employment law with regards to all aspects of employment litigation, employment counseling, and immigration. So he's going to share some information with us and just kind of give us a taste of some different examples um, of social media and stuff that he's seen in the workplace. So thank you for joining us, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Aaron, and, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you today and give you a brief overview of one of the uh, rapidly emerging areas of uh, uh, the law that are impacting employers uh, daily now, it seems like. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you and give you a brief overview of how the law is trying to address and juggle the respective rights of employees and employers as it relates in a, in a world where we are digitally connected um, in ways that seem to be changing um, daily almost. Um, in, in many respects, you know, the technology is way out in front of the law. Um, and so what laws we have on the books right now that, that I as you know, a practitioner have to try to balance and and, and interpret and, and apply for for you when you're trying to deal with your employees and what they are doing you know, with technology, you know, either at work or about you, um, is at best a crude you know, application here. But I, in, in any event, I want to at least go through some of the you know the issues so that you can recognize those. Not so much that to know what the answer is right away, but to know. You know, this is one where we really need to pause and get some guidance. Um, again, there, there are interests that abound for both you as a business owner or as a boss and, and for your employees. And again, technology is not a bad thing. Um, we need to uh, keep in mind um, trying to get the uh, page to go to the next slide. All right. There you go. Are you having any luck? I'm not having any luck moving. I see your mouse is moving, so maybe try to, um, are you right clicking or left clicking? Like I said, the wonders of technology. Yeah, we love it. Let me try something else a moment, just a second. Okay, give it just a second. You should have, the mouse is moving, so try to click through. Apologize for this, folks, so bear with me. What about, let's see, I'm not sure why it's not clicking because we have the mouse moving. I apologize. Have you tried to right and left click? Yes. Okay, well, there. <laughs> All right. Well, let's hopefully we can, can make this work. Uh, you know, from your employees' perspective, I mean, their interests are, you know, one, 
their perception of what their privacy rights are or aren't um, in the workplace. Two, that's going to affect you know their morale at, at at work, whether they're happy, content, or upset or angry. And, and two, you know, technology is going to affect you know their productivity. And so again, uh, technology has made us all much more efficient and effective. Uh, your concerns, on the other hand, as an employer, um, as much as technology serves our interests, and we also have to worry about you know it being used for purposes that don't advance our interests. And we sometimes refer to this as the cyber slacker, the person who's spending all their time on the internet, you know, reading everything but what you want them to do. You know, the computer, the technology has you know the risk of you know viruses and other sort of high tech sabotage. Um, we all know we all have on occasion misdirected an email that went to the wrong party. So technology can have the unintentional consequences to our business, uh, particularly as it relates to information that might be confidential, proprietary, or trade secret. Um, I've been you know, representing employers since the late 80s, and, and now more and more of our harassment cases in the workplace, whether gender-based, racial-based, or otherwise, or just simply interpersonal harassment, is taking on you know, a digital format, um, either pictures, emails, um, YouTube, and the technology is just exploding. Uh, the other really hot issue that we've seen in the last two or three years where Facebook social media has collided with employer rights and responsibilities is in the context of labor unions and other you know what we call protected concerted activity in the National Labor Relations Act, which I will spend a fair amount of time talking about with you in this program. Um, technology creates the potential risk to you as a business person of defamation or disparagement claims, depending on what your employees are saying or publishing to third parties through a digital domain. And then, you know, again, whether they're downloading music, movies, other intellectual property, you know, you can be potentially responsible for copyright or intellectual property infringement with technology. So as we're trying to deal with these, you know, major issues and conflicting concerns, you know, we have to decide what are our arsenal of tools that are available to us. And I'm going to talk to you in general about policies that you want to be considering and putting in place. Um, as well as you know what your rights are as an employer to monitor what your employees are doing uh, while they're using your equipment, whether a PC, a tablet, or, or even a smartphone. Uh, and then finally, you know what are the the current legal restrictions as of 2013? And again, three years ago, you know they weren't nearly as developed as they are today, and I have no doubt that in 2014, 2015, and beyond, we'll see even further. You know, legal developments, but at least want to give you an update of where we are right now. So the starting point I want to talk to you about as far as, you know, sort of, you know, the legal issues we need to be mindful of, uh, I always start off with the Electronic Communication Privacy Act of, yes, that's not a typo, 1986. So again, it shows you, you know, really how difficult it is to apply some of the concept because when this law was written in 1986, None of us had even heard of the internet, let alone used it. Uh, I was still in law school myself, certainly didn't have a computer, uh, didn't have anywhere near the kind of technology we have now, yet we're dealing with a law that was written back in the days of landlines, telephones only, um, and, 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 and voicemail, and you know what were sort of the, the do's and don'ts you know, that applied to employer monitoring of those type of communications. I will give you a brief overview of the Illinois statute that's similar to the, the ECPA. And then finally, I want to talk to you about you know, the National Labor Relations Act. And for those of you who think that that law only applies to employers that have unionized employees, um, that's, not, that's a mistaken understanding. The National Labor Relations Act applies to all private sector employers, whether there's a labor union in place or not. Um, Let's first talk about the, the, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. There are essentially two different titles, two different parts of the act. Title I deals with the interception of electronic communications.
again when this law was written, this was the eavesdropper. This was the, the, the wiretapper. This is the guy out in the, you know, the detective who spliced into your phone line off the pole and was listening to phone conversations. So that's Title I. Title II deals with the accessing of stored communications. Again, back in 1986, voicemail messages. Um, but both of these now apply to you know, interception of emails or reviewing or accessing uh, emails. And so I want to talk to you about how each of those you know, apply. Now this slide I don't want to spend a whole lot of time other than just to show you the actual statutory text and this, you know, so you can appreciate you know, how crude you know, this text is, how dense it is and how we as practitioners and you as employers have to try to apply these vague concepts in, in today's day and age. But again, it, it, it prohibits the interception of any wire, telegraph, oral, phone call, or electronic communication, email. Um, and, and again, the interception is when someone you know, obtains the contents without consent. Um, now, in this part of the act, it has to be an intentional act. So if you, you know, you happen to, you know, pick up the wrong line of an old phone that has multiple lines and hear someone's, you know, conversation for, you know, 10 seconds and then hang up, that's not a violation because there was no intent in that instance to listen into the conversation. Now, Conversely, you know, as far as the intent factor, you know, accessing a stored communication, again, uh, can be based upon, you know, either without authorization, meaning you know, an employee left their email open and you went in and reviewed their emails, didn't have their permission, didn't break into it, but you, you know, you didn't have authorization to look at it, or if you had some limited authorization, you went beyond uh, what was authorized. Um, and, and reviewed stored communications. So here's you know at least a real life example where there was a violation by an employer. Uh, the Van Alstein case, um, this you know situation many of you may have encountered the the employee had you know left his or her uh, I believe it was her her password to her her Yahoo account scribbled down on a notepad, the employer found it, the employer went in without her knowledge, used her password and went in and reviewed you know, all her email messages and discovered, much to their shock and dismay, that she had sent a number of emails on their equipment, mind you, but through her personal email account to her personal attorney uh, in order to assist her claim of discrimination against her employer. Um, the employee, the employer, printed off all these messages, forwarded copies to their attorney, and the attorney then impeached the current employee with all these emails between her and her attorney during her deposition. Uh, needless to say, uh, the court did not look favorably on both the employer in that instance and the employee. Uh, excuse me, and the attorney. So even though, again. The employee was partially responsible for using um, their equipment you know, and, and, and leaving her personal password around. The employer still didn't have permission to access her email account. And, and so the employer was convicted, you know, the elect violation of electronic communications privacy act is a criminal statute, so the employer was convicted of a crime in that regard. The lawyer was also, you know, disciplined by the Bar Association and there was significant repercussions uh, in the civil suit by the employee against the employer. Um, also, you cannot, you know, there are some employers or some utilities that will download software that will sort of, you know, keep track of the keystrokes. Um, and so some employers can use that software incorrectly to find passwords just by having, you know, a log of the keystrokes that the employee went through when they're using their equipment. Again. It's one thing to monitor your own email system or you know your employees' emails through your network. It's another to use you know any type of tool to access a Yahoo account, a Gmail account, a Hotmail account, any other third-party email site um, without the employee's express 
voluntary given consent. In, in addition to um, you know using some sort of software to discover an employee's password or you know guessing what the employee's password is because they use the same password for everything, you also cannot ask you know other individuals to give you passwords. The Knopp airline, uh, the Knopp versus Hawaiian Airlines case, again there was a number of pilots that had you know set up a private chat room where they would discuss all their opinions of the merits of the management of Hawaiian Airlines in sort of a confidential private chat room. Um, and one of the supervisors was aware of this chat room. He went to one of the employees and says, I want to be able to look in the chat room, see what people are saying about us, see what people are saying about me. Another employee gave him the, the login information, the password information. Um, the manager went in, reviewed it, was not happy with what was being said about him. Um, and the court there said even though he had been given the login information and password information by an employee, it was not given freely and voluntarily. The, the other employee said, well, I felt I had no choice. He was my boss. If I said no to him, there would be negative repercussions. So yes, I gave him the password, but not because I felt I had any choice in the matter. So again, you know, this instance, the employer did not, you know, break into the account, did not, you know, use any of the, the uh, encryption tools to locate the login information, yet nonetheless, um, the consent there was not viewed as being voluntary and, and, and knowing, and so there was a violation of, again, the Stored Communications Act when the boss went in and started reading all the chat room postings. So what are sort of the statutory defenses to a violation? Again, the first one that I talked about briefly is the consent exception. Um, how many folks can recall calling up a customer service line of a company, whether Best Buy or otherwise, and you hear you know the recorded message saying something along the lines that this you know this recording will be monitored for customer service purposes? That disclaimer in there is actually done so that the you are essentially consenting to someone else either listening in to the conversation when you're having it or going back and reviewing the audio tape afterwards. So the consent exception again when knowingly and voluntarily given is a valid consent. Just as a quick aside, a lot of times you know what I want to talk to folks about is you know a violation of the electronic Communications Privacy Act can occur when someone tape records a meeting. Now under federal law, one party to the conversation can consent to the recording, and that can be the person who's actually doing the tape recording. Illinois law requires both parties, both the taper and the tapee, to consent. Um, and so, you know, that may be, you know, again, if you have a tape recording done by one party's knowledge, that's not going to violate the federal law, but it is going to violate the state law. Now, where it is a violation under both, uh, and that was, for those of you who may remember Seinfeld, there was an episode where George Costanza thought that people were talking about him behind his back you know, in a board meeting, and so he left a tape recorder in his briefcase, left his briefcase in the board meeting, and had the tape recording running. In, in that particular instance, you know, he was not part of the conversation, and so that recording actually would violate you know, the, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act because none of the parties to the conversation were either aware of the recording or had consented to it. Uh, but if George had been in the meeting, then it would not have been a violation unless that meeting occurred in Illinois. Uh, the, the other exception that deals, that applies for us in terms of monitoring our emails or you know, our stored emails is the business extension exception. Again, that was originally written for purposes of monitoring phone calls, but applies the same effect to reviewing business emails. So, you know, what we need to do now is blow, blow off the desk to our old, you know, policies on telephone etiquette where you know, we you know, advise employees that they can use our phones, but there's no expectation of privacy to any voicemail messages that are left on our system 
or any phone calls. If we're going to monitor phone calls, you know, we can do that without their knowledge. But we need to make sure our policy is, is clear and explicit so that we have, you know, the express waiver, you know, as it relates to any monitoring of phone calls or voicemail messages. Likewise, we update it now for, you know, monitoring of, of email messages sent to or from the employee through our network. You know, there may be lots of emails that get sent, and I guarantee all of us listening to this call at one point or another have sent a personal email using our work email system. It just is going to happen. Um, and so, you know, there is no expectation of privacy, though, that, you know, the employer, you know, is prohibited from reviewing those emails, but we want to make sure our policies are clear and explicit that the employer has the right to monitor any email messages that are left on our system. Again, this slide up here just shows you the actual statutory language about the business ex extension exception. Um, these next couple slides I want to go over, just want to give you some some language that I've seen in common policies that you can incorporate or utilize in updating and revising your you know internet policies, your computer use policies, your email policies, and, and your social media policies. Keep in mind also that you know more and more employers are either paying for or reimbursing employees, you know, for you know smartphones that again have access to the internet. And even the smartphones, you know, will leave a digital trail that, you know, can be monitored, examined through messages that are stored on the SIM card or other, um, you know, essentially hard drive on a tablet or, or a laptop. Now, again, as I mentioned, you know, the laws are now trying to catch up with the technology. Illinois passed beginning this year the Right to Privacy in the Workplace Act which made it explicitly unlawful for an employer to request any employee to give them their password um, or login information for any social networking site. You know, some employees may have a Facebook page that's not secured or not you know, private. Others may be wide open, but if an employee has a, a Facebook page and they've got it, you know, restricted, you know, an employer can't you know, demand that the employee, you know, befriend them so they can see their Facebook page or otherwise give them access to review any of the employees' personal blogs, their Facebook, their Twitter messages, anything along those lines in the social media world. Now I want to shift gears a little bit and, see, and talk to you about where we're seeing the most activity, where employers are having the most challenges as it relates to monitoring their employees' digital activities, either at work or away from work, but through the digital world. Again, the National Labor Relations Act, um, while it normally protects you know, employees that have brought a labor union in to represent their interests, it's not limited to just that context. And so the Labor Board has been where there has been the most activity um, in terms of trying to strike you know, balances between what's you know, fair for the employer and where that line you know, can't be crossed. And we're going to talk about that in, in significant detail because this is the one that's most likely to come back and hit your desk. So let's talk about, first of all, why the National Labor Relations Act even applies to what your employees may be saying on their own time, on their own equipment, but you and your business. Um, Section 7 of the Act, and you'll sometimes hear people talk about Section 7 rights, protects all employees that act together in a concerted manner for the purpose of either collectively bargaining with a labor union or for other mutual aid or protection of, of all employees. And so since it's not just limited to collective bargaining activities, the other mutual aid or protection is where you know this part of the act will extend to all employers, not just unionized employers. And, and so while an employee acting on his or own her own for only his or her own interest might not be engaging in protected concerted activity, 
Uh, when you have two or more employees, or you have one employee acting, you know, on behalf of the interest of all, the labor board will take a very expansive view of what is protected concerted activity beyond much of what you would think would be, you know, fair uh, activities for employees to engage in. So I want to talk to you about how expansively they've been applying this in a again a social media world. In, in, and the best way to sort of do this in the context of social media is to go through several sort of cases that the labor board has 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 addressed, um, and, and these are sort of giving us sort of you know, markers of where the lines are and where they are you know, not being drawn in terms of disciplinary rights of employee employers. Again, we don't have any bright line rules here, and, and frankly, we don't have any any legal court decisions yet. The, the National Labor Relations Board is, is an administrative agency at the federal level. Um, the board is comprised of you know, five individuals who are appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And for those of you who <laughs> have been following the news this week, it's been in the news again about the, the current board appointments. But those five individuals are appointed by the president. By law, you know, three only three of the five can be Democrats. The other two have to be Republicans. And, they are sort of the, the board of directors and the final arbiter at the labor board. Below the five board members, you have regional offices who will prosecute, well, they'll investigate claims and then they'll bring you know, complaints if they think there's a violation to an administrative law judge. So the administrative law judge will you know, be the first person that will hear evidence and rule that an employer or employee, if they're not satisfied with the result, can appeal that decision to the five-person board and then the board will issue a decision, and then once that decision is rendered by the full board, then the losing party can go to the Court of Appeals, which will then issue rulings on these decisions. As we go through the slide, right now we've had several ALJ decisions. We've had you know, one or two full board decisions. We've not had any court decisions yet that have weighed in on you know, whether or not the lines that the Labor Board is drawing is the right lines to be drawn in the employment setting. But right now, this is the best information we have, the best rules of the road that we have right now to go on. And so I will just go through at least how the Labor Board views it and so that you can make sure you stay on the lawful side of the equation rather than find yourself having to defend an adverse disciplinary action uh, in front of the ALJ at the Labor Board. So the American Medical Response is an ENT ambulance company in Connecticut. As you can see, this case was brought by the NLRB in October of 2010. This was really the first case that they ever brought, challenging an employer that disciplined its employees for Facebook postings. This is one that got all the, the national publicity and, 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 and shocked a lot of people when this was filed. And in this particular instance, an employee on you know, the employee's own time at home you know, posted a number of critical comments about the supervisor. The supervisor had previously questioned the employee about a customer complaint, um, and then he was upset about being questioned by the boss, and and brought you know the disagreement to the Facebook page. Uh, a number of her coworkers posted comments on her Facebook page, um, and again there had a little dialogue going on between the employee and several of her coworkers. The employer caught wind of this, felt that the, all the employees were making comments about the supervisor that were you know, not fair or appropriate, um, and so the employer disciplined the employees for making comments that you know, they thought were disparaging, defamatory, um, and, and were presenting the company in a negative light. The labor board concluded that this was protected concerted activity because the complaints were about workplace issues um, and that the employees had a right to discuss such issues amongst themselves. So the Labor Board concluded that this was, in fact, protected concerted activity, and even though the policy had prohibited disparaging or defamatory comments that could not be used as a basis to discipline employees for talking about terms and conditions of employment. There was no decision on the merits of this complaint because before it could be, 
the hearing was held, the employer agreed to change its policies to rescind the discipline and to provide you know, back pay payments to the employees who had been terminated. So this was nothing more than a charge being filed, but no ruling about whether or not the law had been violated in this instance. Hispanics United at Buffalo, again, this is a nonprofit um, company in Buffalo, New York. Essentially, two employees started having a dispute amongst themselves about whose job it was to do what task. All these sort of Facebook postings occurred, again, on the employee's own time away from work at home. Um, one employee took to Facebook, was complaining about the other employee's criticism of, of her department, um, and was defending you know, their performance in, in response to the other employee's you know, accusations of not doing their job. And again, the employer in this instance terminated all the employees who were, were posting um, about the dispute at work um, because it was a, the disputes in general were discussing work-related issues whose job it was or why the performance was or was not acceptable. The labor board took the view that that was, again, cons protected concerted activity and that the employer could not discipline employees for having such conduct away from work on their own time amongst themselves. Um, on this slide, I'm actually giving you a flavor of you know, some of the actual Facebook posts. Um, to show you sort of how generic these are. We see these all the time, but the original Facebook post that led to the termination was Lydia Cruz, a coworker, feels that we don't help our clients enough at Hispanic United of Buffalo. I about had it. My fellow co coworkers, how do you feel? Um, and then the other employees joined in and, and, and defended um, the department from Ms. Cruz's criticism. Uh, Ms. Cruz even got wind of it, was involved in Facebook posting, and went on herself and say, stop with your lies about me. Uh, again, not exactly what we'd normally think about a workplace discussion, um, but since it was related to workplace issues, it fell within the legal protections under the National Labor Relations Act. Again, after hearing all the evidence, the administrative law judge agreed that this was a violation and concluded that the Facebook communications in this instance with each other in reaction to Ms. Cruz's criticisms of the manner in which Hispanic United Buffalo performed their jobs is protected speech. Now the postings did not go across the line of being misconduct. They were not made at work or on work time. Um, they were related to matters that they had a right to discuss under the Act and they were not in the nature of a, of a verbal assault or an outburst. Uh, after the administrative law judge concluded that uh, these terminations were unlawful, they appealed to the full labor board. The labor board decision last December in the three to one decision agreed with the administrative law judge. Um, now another sort of aside here is, you know, strictly speaking, whether or not this is a valid decision remains to be seen. You may have read in the press about uh, a, a constitutional question that is being brought to the Supreme Court, whether or not the president had a right to make recess appointments of, four, four, of the board members that issued this decision. Uh, so while this decision may ultimately you know, not stand for reasons unrelated to the merits, depending on how the Supreme Court handles the, the null canning appeal, um, I think at the end of the day, the result here is probably the right result. Certainly the new labor board, once it's been, you know, has a quorum of confirmed board members, would likely reach the same result in my judgment. So I think this case, even though it may not ultimately stand up on appeal uh, for reasons other than the merits of the decision, it does provide very good, you know, you know a very good roadmap for you in terms of where the line are in terms of your right to discipline employees for any off work negative criticisms of your company or your management. Um, but anytime you have conduct which is engaged in or on the authority of other employees and not solely by a single employee, that ordinarily is going to be considered concerted activity. Um, and in this particular instance, it included 
as the board recognize circumstances where individual employees seek to initiate or to induce or prepare for group action as well as individual employees bringing truly group complaints to the attention of management. So again, it gives a broad uh, interpretation of what is protected concerted activity. Um, again, in this particular instance, the court felt that these communications were clearly of this nature. The employee said she had about had it, about these complaints, um, solicited her coworkers' views about the criticism, and ultimately when the other coworkers responded on Facebook, uh, the labor board felt that you know, the solicitation of comments of protest uh, the other employee and her four coworkers made common cause with her, and together their actions were concerted because they were undertaken with other employees. So that was an instance where you know the conduct was protected concerted activity. Now I'll at least show you one where the labor board concludes it's not protected concerted activity. An employee is not free from discipline. Um, this case. You know, is a BMW dealership up near Chicago. Um, they were having a customer appreciation event one Saturday. Um, one of the salesmen felt that the, the dealership was being, you know, kind of chintzy with its offerings, only buying hot dogs and chips and bottled water, rather something you know more affluent for their their hot, their the customer base, and took out his phone, took a picture posted the picture on his Facebook that he was happy to see the dealership went all out for the new rollout series of the, the new BMW you know, 5 Series. Now, this employee also um, had other Facebook you know, postings that he put out there you know, with his smartphone. There was a, about a week before this customer appreciation deal, there was a, you know, another employee, another uh, customer who was doing a test drive of a, of a Range Rover. Um, actually drove the Range Rover into the pond and the employee took a picture of the, uh, the new Range Rover in the pond and made some some snarky comments about that and you'll and I'll explain the significance of the Range Rover you know, in a moment but when the dealership learned of the the, the snarky posts on Facebook and and saw them and were brought pictures of those or printouts of those you know they called the salesman in chastised you know him for his behavior they actually asked him what he was thinking when he did it, and I think, frankly, he truthfully said, well, I really wasn't thinking. I just did it and posted it, thought it was funny. They demanded he take him down. He took him down immediately, and they turned around and terminated him for these unflattering Facebook posts. Now, ultimately, when this case was tried to the administrative law judge, you know, the, the judge looked at these two separate postings differently. The, the, the picture and the Facebook post about the customer appreciation event, uh, the, you know, the administrative law judge was satisfied that that was protected concerted activity because as a salesman being largely commissioned, it was sufficiently related to his terms and conditions of employment because he, in his view, said I might get less sales because we were just giving away, you know, hot dogs and stale chips. Um, and so even though, you know, he made a snarky comment about the event. It didn't take itself out of the work context sufficiently enough to lose its protection. Um, the administrative law judge went on to observe that even though the, the author, in this case the salesman, quote, used the literary technique of satire and irony to make their point, does not deprive the communication that they produced of any protection under Section 7. Um, however, if that had been the only Facebook post and the and that had been the sole basis for the termination, the labor board, the administrative law judge would have likely concluded that there was a violation. But the judge in this instance also relied upon the separate Facebook post about the test drive of a Range Rover and the disparaging comments about the, the customer in that instance and concluded that that was sufficiently too far removed from the workplace terms and conditions of employment to fall within the protection under the, the National Labor Relations Act. And so since the employer would have been, would have terminated the salesman for even that post, you know, according to the judge, then in this particular instance the termination was lawful, even though one reason was you know, unlawful, the second reason being lawful was sufficient to uh, 
uh, uphold the termination. And the full board uh, later last year agreed with the administrative law judge and concluded that this individual was properly terminated. Last case I want to talk to you about uh, by the labor board is called Triple Play Sports Bar. Um, this, you know, this bar owner, not a terribly good tax accountant, um, and so he did not do the proper tax withholding from his employees' wages during the year. And an employee expecting to get a, be getting a tax refund at the end of April found out that instead of getting a refund, they actually owed money to the IRS. And you know, he or she was not happy about that. Um, and so this employee, once they got back from their meeting with H&R Block, um, posted a critical comment on Facebook about the improper withholding. Another employee posted IO2, such an asshole, referring to the boss. And another employee, you know, read these two postings and clicked the little like button on the Facebook page, giving a little thumbs up to the above messages. Um, ultimately, the, the bar owner became aware of this, you know, commentary about you know, his tax withholding uh, and fired the employees for being disloyal. Uh, the labor board, again, issued a complaint because the postings in question concern work conditions, specifically whether or not proper tax withholdings were being, you know, withheld by the employer, and they had a right to comment about that amongst themselves. The, the, the judge also concluded that the employee who didn't post anything, didn't express any words, but by simply clicking on the like button under Facebook, that too was a form of, of, of speech that was protected as concerted activity because you know, he or she was indicating that you know, she agreed with the criticism. Uh, finally, again, uh, I guess consistent with the old notion that you know, sticks and stones may you know, break our bones, but words can never hurt us, um, referring to the boss as an asshole was not sufficiently disparaging uh, to take the overall criticism beyond uh, protection. Um, again, this was not a comment made directly to the boss in his or her presence. It was online rather than, you know, wasn't at work and didn't involve any other, you know, threats of physical violence towards, you know, the boss. Essentially, with the, labor, with the administrative law judge concluded that, you know, venting their frustrations is not, you know, malicious per se and is not going to, you know, take the speech outside of being protected as concerted activity. I'm going to skip the next couple of slides, but this is another general counsel advice memorandum uh, that was issued about two years ago. Um, it, it again recognizes that at the end of the day, the employee, uh, along you know, consistent with the, the BMW dealership, the the, the Facebook post have to be related to workplace issues of the employee, either you know individually or as a group. Um, it's not enough just to be venting in general or complaining in general or just expressing opinions about non-work-related issues. Um, and, and so um, there, there is going to have to be some comment, some connection to a workplace, you know, wage benefit disciplinary action, disciplinary policy to be protected from uh, as protected concerted activity. Now, we have to be careful with our policies uh, that we do have in place. Uh, if we're trying to rely upon discipline on general confidentiality policies about don't talk about things about work with others, the labor board is going to be open concerned about an overbroad policy. In their view, employees have a right to share amongst themselves, you know, on their own time, information about the company practices, their pay, their compensation, and by policy you cannot restrict those communications. And so if you start disciplining employees because they violated your confidentiality policies when they talked about wage information with themselves or other persons, on Facebook or on social media, the labor board is going to be less inclined to uphold your rights uh, because, again, they give employees broad protection to discuss amongst themselves 
uh, specific you know information about your work policies, your work practices, and your terms and conditions of employment. The Labor Board, in fact, um, has drafted what they view as a social media policy, which is acceptable. It, 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 and so if you go to the, the Labor Board website, you know, www.nlrb.gov, you actually can look at, you know, at least a policy that they believe is legally permissible. Uh, it, it probably has been watered down to, to the point of not being a much practical use, uh, but it is at least an example of a policy that they believe um, balances your rights and, and the rights of your employees to you know, withstand a challenge as being too broad um, and chilling their, their communications or their discussions. I know it's a little bit you know difficult in a webinar to get a feel for for you whether or not uh, I've confused you, clarified things, um, but now I'd certainly you know, left about uh, ten minutes uh, and, and will share any questions that you have, any comments you have, any concerns you have, so I can try to give you some some additional guidance to you know, help you as you try to balance these interests going forward. All right, so if anyone has any questions, feel free to type those in in the next couple minutes at the bottom of our webinar. And then we can get those answered for you. Don't be afraid. We all know this is not about you. It's your friend who has this question. That's, that's okay. This is the time really to try to uh, discuss about these as we can. And if you don't have time to ask questions today, feel free to contact uh, myself or Thomas. We would be happy to um, point you in the right direction on your questions, especially if you think of some maybe after the webinar today. Absolutely. Don't hesitate. All right. I don't see that anyone is asking any questions today. Um, I think you covered everything pretty thoroughly. I appreciate your uh, webinar and all the information that you gave us today. Everyone, just tune in next month. We are doing another webinar uh, talking about automated timekeeping in your business and how it relates to the uh, Affordable Care Act and the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act. Uh, that's going to be on August 15th at 1 o'clock, and you will be receiving an email, so take a look for that. And like I said, in the meantime, if anyone has any questions uh, regarding any of this information that you heard today, feel free to give us a contact. Everybody have a good day. Thank you.